Hi everyone, this is Shane Armin Rowe, and today we're going to give you 10 things you need to know about the Valve Steam Deck. Stick around. You'll be amazed at what works right out of the box. One of the benefits of a traditional console handheld is that, well, it just works. You take it out of the box, you charge it, you plug in a cartridge, and you're good to go. The Steam Deck, being a pocket PC, is worrisome to potential buyers, as possibly needing a lot of tinkering to render results. However, having immediate access to a large part of your Steam library is something that is truly amazing. Thousands of games are verified on deck, meaning they play perfectly. Hundreds more are playable, meaning there may be some things like UI or minor control issues, and thousands more that are likely to work but simply haven't been tested. But seeing over 100 games in my library ready for action and over 800 more potentially good to go? Pretty wild stuff. It's crazy to think you can purchase a brand new gaming handheld that has a library of over 2,000 games already playable on it day one, and you probably own one or many of them. Crazy comfortable, but tiny hands need not apply. When we first saw the layout of the Steam Deck with the high position D-pad and face buttons along with the rear paddles, we thought for sure Valve had lost their minds. There is no way this could be comfortable. Throw in the weight, the size, and possibly high heat output, and it would seem to be a recipe for disaster. When the deck was announced, I had a friend 3D print a full-size replica, and I was shocked as to how comfortable the layout seemed and was delighted to find out the actual hardware felt the same way. We'll talk about the controls in a minute, but the size and weight are so well distributed, it is not uncomfortable at all to hold, as long as you have big hands. You can see how I hold this, that my big monster hands are in perfect positions to access everything, including the analog sticks and triggers, as well as the rear paddles. A slight shift of my hands, and I can easily get access to the D-pad and face buttons in a comfortable manner as well. And watching me manhandle this thing, it's not hard to imagine that those with smaller hands could easily have issues keeping a hold of it and making this layout work for them. Certainly an external controller of their choice could be an option, but that would assuredly ruin the whole point of this fully portable gaming device. Much like lugging a Nintendo Pro controller around with your Switch everywhere you go simply isn't practical. Controls are king and the deck is royalty. Gaming on a handheld is only as good as the controls themselves. Every handheld I've ever owned has something fairly major wrong with it. Poor throw analog sticks, badly positioned button arrangements, mushy D-pad, spongy triggers, weak bumpers, and the list goes on and on. I can honestly say there is nothing bad about the Steam Deck controls. The analog sticks feel great, the face buttons look a little bit close together, but you really don't think about it once you're playing. The D-pad is easily amongst the best I've had the pleasure of working with, and that says a lot. The triggers have no hair trigger settings, which might be my biggest complaint here, but do not feel cheap or mushy. In fact, with racing games and those games that need precision analog pulls on the trigger, they feel fantastic. The rear paddles take some getting used to, though, if you're not used to the excellent Xbox Elite controllers. Uh, the Elite 2 is the controller by which I judge all others. And I imagine if you've never used them before, you're going to need some time to ramp up with them. But they are natural and they're really easy to get to. The bumpers also feel like quality, which is kind of a surprise to me. Many of the controllers I own have poor bumpers. My biggest issue with the controls is that the transitioning from the trigger to the bumper isn't very seamless, at least not for my hands. Most games won't require this sort of agility, but I've actually taken to moving the bumpers to the rear paddles for faster access when playing games where I need fast finger swapping between them. And oddly enough, once you get used to it, it seems rather natural. Before we leave the topic, it must be mentioned that SteamOS has a crazy amount of control customization that really separates it from every other handheld or even gaming console I've ever owned. Not just a simple button remapping, such as changing L3 to a paddle, but changing analog acceleration profiles, assigning keyboard strokes to buttons, using gyro controls for aiming, replacing mouse-based games with trackpads, and so much more. If you've used Xbox accessories to customize an Elite controller, you've seen about half the abilities of the tools in SteamOS. 
These controller profile options deserve a full video on them alone, but at least now you know they're there. The bigger screen most certainly matters. One of the many elephants in the room is the concept of playing big screen PC games on a little tiny 7 inch screen, and this is most assuredly a valid concern. Many of us had a taste of what indie game ports looked like on these micro screens when playing the 6.2 inch screen of the Nintendo Switch over the years. In addition to almost another full inch of screen, and when you say one sixth bigger, it hits home a little better, the Steam Deck does offer something that the Switch does not, the ability to magnify the screen with a button set. While it looks and sounds great on paper as a bullet point, the truth is that the usefulness of this is limited by the fact that you have to hold the awkward button combo to keep the magnifier on. Steam Plus L1 is super uncomfortable in general, and to hold it for any length of time to read long form text, not so great. It is nice to have, of course, but a true toggle on off would have been far more useful. With that said though, we cannot ignore the fact that a seven inch screen is nearly 12% bigger than a 6.2 inch one, which is the size of the aforementioned Nintendo Switch and even my Samsung Galaxy S21 phone. 12% makes a big difference. Sure, many games are still going to be very uncomfortable to digest at that size, but that 12% brings in more of those thousands of games into a playable state where frankly on the Switch or my phone, it might be a total wash. When I raised this complaint about Switch, I was told to play them docked on a TV instead. And once you got to know where all the controls are and how the game works, you can probably play it portable. I would offer the same advice here. From a quality brightness perspective, I would say the screen is on par with the original Nintendo Switch, but my wife's newer model definitely makes me wish we'd gotten an OLED option on the deck. There really is a full-blown computer in there. For many busy professionals and travelers, we must often make margin calls on what devices we want to bring with us on trips. While many of us have learned to use our phones to handle the majority of our work on the go, let's face it, a nice laptop or Chromebook can make light work of bigger chores. As such, many are likely to forego a dedicated gaming device like a Switch in favor of something more versatile that might also happen to play some type of entertainment. During travel, I usually pack a TV streamer like an NVIDIA Shield TV or Google TV dongle to watch my Plex server on the go from the hotel. Our insatiable need for technology fuels a really nice selling point for the Steam Deck. There is a full-blown Arch Linux PC running on this thing, giving you access to many of the same apps and tools you already use. With things like bottles or wine, even some of your esoteric Windows apps may be able to come along for the ride. The UI is a friendly KDE Plasma desktop, and while there are some migration pains to get used to, it is very similar to the comfortable Windows in many ways. Toss a small Bluetooth multi-device featuring a keyboard and mouse in your bag, and the deck can handle heavier internet sessions, document editing, and much more using desktop features you probably use at home, like extended or mirrored screens, and juggling a multitude of windows at once. It only takes about 10 to 15 seconds to flip from gaming mode to desktop mode, but it does take about 40 seconds to boot from a fully powered off state. But the deck features an amazing standby and sleep mode that consumes very little power, so there isn't much incentive to completely shut it down ever. Forget about Windows, at least for now. Valve has not been very quiet about telling everybody that this device is yours and you can do with it what you want, including alternative versions of Linux or yes, even Windows. The Steam Company does not support alternative operating systems directly, but their indirect support in the way of basic drivers for SD card, network adapter, AMD GPU drivers seems pretty decent. As a bonus, they have provided a system recovery image to allow you to recover from almost any experiment you may undertake with the deck. If you scour the realms of YouTube, you will find plenty of videos showing off Windows running on the deck and even going so far as to boast performance improvements when using that operating system. There are far more reasons not to run Windows than there are to use it. First, it's really easy to bork your Steam Deck if you're not completely clear on what you're doing. I feel like a pretty competent dude and one of my attempts to run Windows on the deck resulted in a full system recovery. There are also key drivers missing for Windows, including robust controller drivers, and maybe, the most important, no sound drivers. That means if you want audio from your Windows deck, 
you must use Bluetooth headphones or speakers and deal with the lag that it offers up. What's more, check out Digital Foundry's video, I'll drop a link in the description below, on the comparison of SteamOS versus Windows, and you will see the net gain is minimal, if at all, when using Windows. Finally, in our spec-driven world where higher numbers equal better product, it is very difficult to impart the importance of user interface and experience. Windows on a handheld, let's be honest, it sucks. Windows often in general kind of sucks. What Valve has done with the Steam OS on the deck is, to quote my Apple-loving fans out there, just hashtag magical and hashtag brave. It is improved to show that they give a damn about the end user experience while making it familiar and comfortable to existing Steam users, which also shows they give a damn about the end user experience. Someday, Windows might kick ass on the deck, but that isn't today. Despite the polish, expect a few bumps. It would be completely disingenuous for me to talk about the deck and not discuss some of the bumps in the road that a device of this power and open nature are going to subject the user to. While the gaming side is very polished and clean, things aren't always where you would expect them to be. Imagine having desktop mode hidden away behind the power controls. There are things like Proton versions to select on a per game basis, and some games will indeed require you launch them with command line parameters acquired from the Proton database. Fortunately, the latter is rare, but not unheard of. Sometimes a game won't exit cleanly and seem to hang the system. This is also rare, but it does happen. Despite there being 2,000 games that are great on deck, the hundreds that are playable each may offer their own distinct challenges to play effectively. This could be UI layout and size issues, the need to flip back and forth between controls, touchscreen and on-screen keyboard, anything that might make the experience a little less magical. Finally, while Valve and the community are helpful in converting game controls to the hardware, sometimes that just isn't going to work for you. You can love gyro control and Doom 2016 all you want, but I'm a controller player normally, and gyro controls are not as comfortable for me as twin sticks. As a user, you're going to be faced with control options you may need to alter to fit your needs. On the desktop side, unless you're an experienced Linux user already, you're going to feel a lot like a dullard trying to do simple things you've been doing on Windows all your life. Now don't let this scare you off though. James T. Kirk once said, man stagnates if he has no ambition, no desire to be more than he is. And this deck will make you more than you are. For those that just want to boot up and play compatible Steam games, you're probably fine. For those that want to harness every possible ounce out of it, expect those bumps. Battery life, a problem you can control. Battery life is the next elephant in the room we need to discuss. From the beginning, Valve has been pretty transparent about the range of battery life possibilities, stating from the beginning that two to eight hours of battery life was to be expected. With a 5300 milliamp battery powering essentially a gaming PC, you would expect the battery life to be in the toilet. I mean, how could a AAA game run on a PC with a battery only slightly bigger than most modern cell phones? These days we complain if our mobile device doesn't last all day and then some with a single charge. How pissed will you be if your debt can't even last through a flight from LA to Seattle? Numbers and power consumptions don't lie, though. If you're playing a high-end game maxed out every which way you can, you can expect possibly even less than two hours of battery. What most people don't consider, though, is that this really is a computer and not a dedicated game console. You are in control. Every single experience doesn't have to be identical from unit to unit. Battery life is always about asking the question, what can I give up? On a mobile phone, maybe you dim your screen or reduce the resolution. Popping it into airplane mode can certainly help. The deck is no different, only here you're fully in charge. If you're a PC gamer, you're already used to fiddling with the settings to try to eke out better frame rates or performance. You're going to do it again here, this time in pursuit of better battery life. But you're not alone here, Valve's got your back. Along with game settings, Deck has a multitude of tools to assist you. From an unbelievably detailed performance overlay to performance settings that let you limit frame rate, throttle processor power, manually control the GPU clock, and more. Shortly, Valve will deliver us a 40 hertz screen mode to save even more power in certain conditions. It is not unfair to say that some games are meant to be played at 60 FPS with all the settings cranked up. Some will be able to handle playing them a bit gimped as a trade-off for doing it on a plane at 20,000 feet. Others 
not so much. If this all sounds scary, you can add this to the bumps we talked about earlier. Fortunately, you can do what other handheld users do. Throw portable power banks at the problem, especially on that flight to go see the Space Needle. Issues others have seen, but I have not. While I have been blessed with a no issues unit, spending an hour or two on the Steam Deck subreddit will reveal they have seen some issues with the deck and I want to be fair in bringing these to you. What really makes headlines is the amount of FedEx mishandlings, misdeliveries, and possibly even outright thefts by drivers. Door cams have shown drivers coming to the door, presumably to record their location, and then walking back to the truck with deck in hand. Whether there's an epidemic going on or not, it's an interesting trend. From a hardware point of view, there are four big things that appear to chap everyone's hide. First, a noisy fan. While my fan sounds like any other fan on a commensurate device, others have reported a loud, whining noise emanating from their deck. So loud and whiny that it distracts from the amazing audio that the deck speakers pump out. The tech nuts have found two different fan manufacturers, and maybe I've got the other one. Hopefully this was an early unit issue, and moving forward we won't see or hear it again. Less objective is that there may be an issue with some units' SSD storage. Some users have reported units that won't finish the initial boot and setup cycle. Some cannot even do a system restore. Presumably, these will have to be RMA'd back to Valve, and nobody wants to be without their new toy for the weeks that that might take. Next up, a sticking B button. This button sits right on the bevel of the right side of the unit, and it is said that some decks have a slightly shorter B button, and this can stick in the housing. I've tried to recreate this with my deck, and it doesn't seem to be a problem. I'll chalk this up as an early fabrication issue that's been fixed, but if you're looking at buying an early unit, ask your friendly eBay scalper about that button before you buy. Finally, there are scatter reports of the SteamOS microSD card formatting, bricking or ruining cards. At this point, there is nothing pointing direct blame at Valve or the deck, but rather the nature of fraudulent or poor quality SD cards. While users are often using name brands like Samsung, there is something to be said about full hard formats of these media sticks as showing chinks in the armor. Even brand new OEM cards can fail under duress, and we all know that Amazon, Walmart Marketplace, and eBay are loaded with misbranded SD cards promising one terabyte storage for 15 bucks. Could there be a legit issue here? I'm not sure we can rule that out just yet. But at this moment, I'm going to recommend everybody do a couple of full formats of your new SD cards before spending the effort to fill them to the brim. While these issues are far and few between, remember, Reddit is full of people with problems, not people talking about how great stuff is. It is worth knowing about them if you're looking to pick up one used or scalped. Easily the best value in handheld emulation. The emulation of classic consoles and computers and even the emulation of newer technology like the Nintendo Switch is really hot right now. To pull that off well, you need three things. Great controls, powerful hardware, and a mature operating system with competent ports of top-notch emulators. There are many $100 or less emulation devices like the Venerable and Bernick that do a decent job in these areas, but tend to lack the horsepower to do the job right after the fourth or fifth generation of consoles and handhelds, making emulation sketchy for systems like PlayStation 2, Dreamcast, GameCube, PSP, and for you computer peeps, Amiga AGA, and other 16-bit systems. The Steam Deck obviously checks all of these boxes in spades. Being based on Linux, the emulators are all there and in fighting shape. The hardware is up to snuff for demanding systems, including PlayStation 3 and Nintendo Switch. Of course, as we said earlier, the controls are all there, Plenty of fully redefinable and customizable buttons, and with twin sticks, track pads for mice, and a touchscreen, you're pretty much covered from all aspects of every old device you might want to emulate. The deck's value is in the completeness of the package regarding emulation. With every emulation device I buy, and I have many, there are always compromises. We put up with compromise because we really didn't have any choice. Until now, if you wanted something even close to the deck, you were looking to drop $1,000. It is easy to question value when the Ambernick is $120 and the deck is $400, but there is simply nothing else out there that checks all the boxes that isn't two or three times the price, and none of them have the panache and style or the backing of a big-name company like Valve. Would I recommend a Steam Deck for the sole purposes of emulation? 
Probably not unless late gen stuff is super important to you. But if you want to have a shot at playing Switch games or PS2 at 60 frames per second, the deck is a 100% no-brainer deal in emulation. And there you have it, 10 things you need to know about the Valve Steam Deck. Thanks always so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, hit the little bell, get more Steam Deck videos coming your way. Thanks for watching. Take care.